Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey peeps, today we're going to take a look at Star Wars Rebellion from Fancy Flight Games. You can hear the tons of plastic just rattling around in there because I just shot the overview and threw them all back in the box, which I know is going to drive some people nuts. Um, that box is heavy. So, this is the newest Star Wars-themed game from Fancy Flight, but obviously they've done tons of those. But this is definitely made to appeal to um, the, uh, I would say, war gamers to a degree. It's, I, don't, I would not call this a war game, but might appeal more to those people. Area control people, people who like Twilight Struggle, people who are into uh, Twilight Imperium. This is the game for those people, as opposed to the living card games and the very light miniature skirmish game of um, uh, X-Wing miniatures game and Armada. Um, this is definitely a, a, di a different breed of game than those. And what this game is thematically, obviously Star Wars, but it's for the original trilogy, uh, 4 through 6, which uh, don't we all wish they were just 1 through 3 at this point? Um, <laughs> and it went straight to Force Awakens. I digress. Uh, so it, it's supposed to take place over the entire width and breadth of episodes 4 through 6. And um, with different events from each of those movies occurring and all the different main characters from the movies and, um, and so on and so forth, different types of uh, uh, vehicles and ground troops, all these different types of things show up in this game. And it's a doozy of a game. It's very complex. This is going to be one of the longest overviews I've ever done since I've done the new format. So please bear with me. And I'm sh I definitely did not cover everything. But hopefully this will give you just a taste. Then we're going to come back and we'll talk about it. Star Wars Rebellion is a 2-4 to four player asymmetrical game. A 3- or 4-player game is a bit different than a 2-player game, which is the standard way to play. We'll come back and talk about that later. In this game, one side takes control of the Imperials, and the other side takes control of the Rebels. They each have different goals. The Imperials need to find the hidden Rebel base and either conquer it by making sure there are no Rebel units left on it, and there's at least one Imperial unit residing on the system, or find it and completely obliterate it using your Death Star. Then, the Imperials immediately win. For the Rebels, survival and running out the clock are the only goals. On the track that keeps track of the rounds of play, there will be a Rebel reputation marker that starts at 14, and a separate marker that is moved forward at the start of each round. If the round marker and the reputation marker are ever in the same space, the game immediately ends in victory for the Rebels. It is possible and probable that the Rebels will find ways to move the reputation marker forward and therefore increase the likelihood of surviving long enough to win. But the Imperials can also take actions to move the marker back. The game plays out on a galactic scale, with systems consisting of planets that are either loyal to the Imperials or subjugated by them, or loyal to the Rebels. An orange bordered section consisting of multiple systems is called a region. For setup, each player takes a double-sided character sheet, with one side being for the two-player game and the other side being for the three- or four-player game, and then a tremendous amount of plastic components, as well as leader standees, four of which they'll have access to right away at the start of the game. There are several decks of cards in the game that will need to be shuffled. You'll start with mission cards and action cards, but there are also projects and probes for the Imperials and objectives for the Rebels. All of those cards will be explained in a few minutes, but action cards correspond to your leaders, and you'll gain more as you gain new leaders. They offer special one-time use abilities keyed into the specific leader. The most important bit of setup for the Rebels is choosing a system that secretly contains the Rebel base. They will look through the probe deck, which has one card for every system on the board, and secretly take one card and place it under the Rebel base section of the board. The Rebel base is treated just like any other system and can house troops that can leave and arrive, but it actually represents one of the other systems on the board that you must keep secret from the Imperials. Therefore, it's dangerous to move your troops away from the hidden Rebel base because then it will reveal your position. Each player starts with several other systems under their control. Imperials always start in Coruscant, and then you will draw cards randomly from the probe deck until you get a certain amount of Imperial and Rebel starting systems, and then distribute starting units to each system appropriately. Through combat, you can control other systems, but missions also let you place loyalty markers into systems. There's even more to the setup that I won't cover here, but the last thing I'll mention are the objective cards for the Rebels. You start with one and get one more each round. 
These are like achievements, and once the conditions are met, you may be able to move the reputation marker up the track. They get progressively stronger and eventually include a Death Star destruction card. Conversely, Imperials have projects. These are special missions you can grab when you complete your R&D basic missions. Among others, some of these missions allow you to activate and use the Death Stars to obliterate systems. Despite this complex setup, the game rounds are rather straightforward. First is the assignment phase. Each player starting with the Rebels may take one or two leaders and assign them to a mission card from their hand. For now, the missions are placed face down with the leaders on top. Each player starting with the Rebels may choose any number of missions and assign one or two leaders to each of them. For now, the missions are placed face down with the leaders on top. Missions give you very powerful effects that change the course of the war, like adding troops, moving troops, sabotage, capturing leaders, etc. But you must assign leaders who meet the necessary skill requirements. Each leader has several different skills, and each is better suited to certain types of missions. You could also assign an extra leader just to ensure the mission goes off without a hitch. We'll get back to all that later. The second phase is the command phase, where, starting with the rebels, you go back and forth taking one or two actions until all players pass. One of the two actions that you can take is revealing and resolving a mission. Simply reveal a played mission card, read it aloud, and then send the place leader to the system the card refers to or that you choose, and either complete it or attempt to complete it. Some missions will succeed automatically, but many times your opponent can interfere if it says attempt. He or she can send one of their available leaders to stop you from resolving the mission. Both players will then roll a number of dice equal to the ranks their combined leaders have in the pertinent skill. Every hit or direct hit counts as one success, and the critical symbol counts for two. If the active player has more successes, the mission succeeds. Resolve the effect, and then discard the card, but leaders will stay put on the planet. Also, starting missions recycle back to your hand after they've been resolved. Alternatively, you can use your leaders to activate systems. Place an available leader in a system, and then you may move units from adjacent systems into that system, so long as the other systems didn't have your leaders there. Ground troops can be moved via large ships, though each type of ship has limited capacity. If you move your units onto a planet loyal to the enemy, or subjugated, as is often the case with the Imperials, and enemy units are present, combat begins. If, however, a loyal rebel system is empty and Imperial troops enter, the system is immediately subjugated, although still loyal to the rebels. Also, if the Imperials move into a new system, the rebel player must immediately reveal if that is the location of the rebel base. If combat does break out, the defending player may place one leader if none are there. Then, each player draws space combat and ground combat cards equal to the applicable stats on one of their leaders. These cards can be activated to give you combat bonuses. A full system combat consists of space combat, followed by ground combat, until either one side retreats or one side destroys the other completely. Either type of combat works the same way. Look at your reference sheet and roll dice of the appropriate amount and color for all of the units you have in the system for that battle. Next, players can use their tactics cards or spend crit symbols to draw more cards. Then, damage is assigned. Regular hits must be used to eliminate health levels of units that match that color. Direct hits ignore color. Crits only count for activating cards. Loyalty markers remove existing loyalty markers or make a neutral system loyal to you. If an Imperial subjugated system loses its last Imperial unit, the subjugation marker is removed completely. Once both players have stopped taking command actions, it's time for the refresh phase. All leaders are retrieved. Two new mission cards are drawn. The Imperial player gets to draw two probe cards and then secretly holds on to them. These give that player hints as to where the hidden rebel base is not. The rebels then draw an objective card, and the time marker moves up. Some of the spaces on the track have symbols. The recruit icons let both players draw two cards from their action card deck and keep one, then recruit a brand new leader to their pool that is depicted on the chosen card. These action cards are one-time use abilities with powerful effects, based on the leaders you have. The build icon lets you add units to your build queue. Look at the systems that are under your control. The icons on those systems match up to the icons next to your unit stats, and the number next to those symbols in the system tells you on which space of the build track to place the appropriate units. After all that, each side will slide down units from one build space down to the next lowest one. 
If you have units on space one and they fall off the track, you gain them and can immediately place them in systems you control, two per system. Note that some special units like the Death Stars, Super Star Destroyers, Ion Cannons, and Shield Generators can only be built by using special mission cards. Then the rounds continue until either the Imperials find and destroy the Rebel base or the rounds marker moves on to the Rebel reputation marker. Team games work in a very similar fashion. If you're playing a four player game, it will be two on two. Each player team uses the other side of the character sheet and you'll notice that the leader pools are split into two for the Admiral and the General. The different leaders that are in the game correspond to each of these different roles. So in other words, the Admiral will have control of all of the leaders that are marked as Admiral leaders and so on and so forth. When it's your turn in the game or your team's turn, you'll be resolving those actions depending on which leaders you have access to. You'll use your leaders to resolve missions, to send them out onto the board and to advance your objectives, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth, and you'll actually resolve them in order based on different numbers on each of the leaders. Also, both the Admiral and the General for each team will have different responsibilities. So for instance, the Admiral's responsibility is recruiting, whereas the General's responsibilities include things like the mission cards or the ground battles. A three-player game is actually surprisingly similar, because what will happen is two players will be on one side, functioning just like in a normal four-player team game, whereas one player will take control of one entire side, but still use the team game side of the sheet. Well, I will not keep you in suspense on this one. I really, really enjoyed this game. I've only played it three times. If I was to play it four, five, six, seven, eight times, I'm definitely not going to dislike it at that point. I may come to love it. That's how much I enjoyed this game. Um, and trust me, I'm not like in the bang, uh, in the bank, in the bag or in the tank for Star Wars. I, I like some Star Wars games. I love um, the the Queen's Gambit and even to a degree the lesser risk version of the Queen's Gambit. Um, I, I really enjoy those games, but I've never been into X-Wings miniatures and I like the movies, but I'm not like a total nut job about them. But this game, standing apart, even if you had it as generic galactic battles of the 34th century, then it would still be a good game. That's how much that I like it. Having said that, I do have a couple of major caveats with the game, which I think a lot of people are going to share with me, even as they still enjoy it. But let's just talk about the good stuff first, okay? We'll get that good stuff out of the way first. Um, this is a game, thematically, as I said in the beginning, it's the whole width and breadth of the um, first uh, three movies, episodes four through six. And you really get that feeling. That's the best thing about this game is the theme and how well it integrates where you're going on all these missions and these grand galactic events are happening. The Death Star moves in and subdues the populace with fear. And then you get to put loyalty markers out. And I mean, you're, you'll notice that I'm going to be slipping in from talking about the theme to the mechanics because they are so well integrated together um, that everything just feels like it is thematic and that it's happening and I'm I'm sending my leader on a covert mission to go and manipulate the populace into inciting a rebellion and then you put troops out and then you fight I mean that's what happens in this game and it just it works so wonderfully um, and the fact that the components are so solid which I almost wasn't even going to mention it because it's fantasy flight you know that the components are going to be good but as you saw in that overview maybe I tried to I didn't dwell on the components too much but they look great and it really gets the point across i mean even with the death stars you have three of them which because you could have one you could have one under construction and one gets put on the track whatever but the fact that you have the one that's in repair or that it's being built is also really cool <laughs> the different types of star destroyers um i mean everything about this game from the how the rebel base is hidden and trying to find it the goals of the game it's not just get some points take over these territories it's find the rebel base and crush it it's survive long enough to get help and maybe steal the death star planes and destroy the death star it just works so well this theme that even if again even if you don't like star wars don't care about it don't know about it there's a few of you out there that might still be like that i think you would still enjoy the theme of this game and the galactic struggle of uh, the galactic struggle of a, a bunch of uh plucky rebels against a giant galactic empire who is overwhelmingly powerful okay so the theme is grade a solid 
best thing about this game. And the components are really good too. I like that they use the artwork, um, the original artwork that Fantasy Flight has done. I know a lot of it is probably reused from the Living Card game and all these other different sources. I don't care. It's better than having still frames. Love that. <laughs> I can't stress that enough. And all of it looks really, really good. Um, so I have no complaints about the presentation or the theme of the game. Not really anyways. Going into the gameplay, the best part individually, I think, is the leader system. Really interesting. Uh, and Well, let's take a step back. Now, as you saw there, really long overview, and I still didn't cover everything. The setup for this game is very long. Just getting it playing, getting it up and running, teaching the game. All of these things are very long, regardless of the number of players. And by the way, I did play it with two players and with four players. Did not play it with three players, but that's basically the four-player game. Um, it is very long, very hard to teach it, but really the round by round gameplay, once you get into it, it's pretty simple and intuitive and the rounds do go by fairly quickly. We're going to come back to that though. Um, and so you can kind of focus on the different elements and find out what's interesting to you. Nothing feels like it's too buried or overwhelmed. And I found the leader system to be super interesting. Um, knowing that you, so you, you start off with the basic leaders, right? Whatever. Um, but then you get the, uh, you'll have the recruitment eventually as you go through the different rounds of the game. And when you get to those recruitment cards, you choose the one that you want. And then that's a very monumental decision. Because then you look at the mission cards that you have. And you're like, well, hmm, okay. Right now, Obi-Wan Kenobi is not doing me much good. Because he's got tons of the like covert ops, but not really the other things I need right now. But in a different situation where you have a card that requires three covert ops, you're like, oh, okay, send them in. And this is another part where the theme really comes into play because, yeah, of course, each leader is going to be tailored uh, towards what they were good at in the movies. And there's, you know, also that action card that enables you, a level one card, or multiple things. So when that action card enables you to not only get a leader, but also be used as a really powerful ability and also a very thematic ability like, Obi-Wan, we need you on this front, stat, so sneak in over here. <laughs> By the way, this is where the theme kind of struggles a bit because, of course... Obi-Wan didn't do any of this. I seem to recall that he just went on one adventure and died after retirement. <laughs> a spoiler alert. Um, but you got to have to just forgive those things and sort of eh, just massage over those. It's, it's fine. Uh, but all these different elements are very interesting. Um, the mission cards, too. The way that those are implemented. Very easy. Just, I want to do this. I'll put my leader here. Let's see what happens. And you get your starting mission cards back, so that gives you a little bit of leverage. You never feel like you're completely overwhelmed that can't do anything, but you might just not have the best options every round, like your opponent, if they are really using their mission cards to the best of their ability. Um, but then be, being able to contest it by throwing in your leaders, that's another important decision. Do I hold back in order to try and uh, stymie you? I never pronounced that correctly. Uh, <laughs> just so many uh, great things going on with that leader system. Uh, and the missions themselves are also very thematic. I love the ones that let you, um, I didn't talk about these in the overview, but there's missions that let the Empire capture um, the leaders of the other party. Or the, uh, the uh, rebels can uh, get allies like Yoda or um, C-3PO and R2-D2 to attach to the leaders and give them bonuses, which is super interesting to me. I really I think it really works well. The actual combat in the game, that might be a bit of a weaker point for me. I do find it interesting, the whole system of grabbing different space and ground combat cards. Again, very, very important which leaders you decide to send onto a planet to send into combat. It's not just, hey, I've got a leader, I'll send some people in. No, look at your opponent's, if you're fighting, look at your opponent's space forces, look at their ground forces. What do you think you're going to have the worst issue with and then take that into account accordingly it's a very important decision but i did find the actual combat to be sort of dull um it's just quick done out um nothing that lively compared to a game like uh forgotten forgotten stars forbidden stars forgotten realms uh <laughs> where the card the combat is amazingly interesting it's got some downsides but it's really fascinating to me um this one was just like eh, let's just get a system in there and work it out <laughs> and we'll just do it and then it's over and pretty much you know that you're going to lose at a certain point. I think this is very rarely we've had it. We're like, oh, hey, look, here's my giant rebel force. And here's your giant imperial force. Usually it's like, oh, there's a giant imperial force. Well, that system's going to die. <laughs> and that's just how it is. And that's one thing you need to know about this game that will, in the very first game of this I played, really frustrated me because I was the rebels. Like, oh, come on, I'm getting killed over here. Well, yeah, of course you're getting killed. You're the rebels going up against the imperial empire. 
you're just supposed to survive. That I could talk about a million things in this game. I can't believe I haven't got I haven't even got to this yet. But the asymmetrical nature of the game and the fact that you um, Imperials are just like find and kill. We got so many resources. We're flooding our build track, which is also cool, with ships. Just a matter of time. And that's the thing. It's just a matter of time for the rebels. Just hold out. Make strategic strikes. Use your leaders wisely. Use your leaders to completely foil the plans. That's The rebels especially want to foil the plans of the Imperials. And if you can do that, it's fantastic. Especially if you're like, oh, they drew project cards. And there's a Death Star there. Yeah. <laughs> really neat how they implement that. So it feels overwhelming when you're the rebel player and the Imperials are bearing down on you. But you can win. And I did win. Uh, well, actually, that was the team game that I won. And let's talk about that for a minute. Um, because I, I, I played um, three games, two-player, and this one game as a four-player game. Um, and I'm sorry, two games, uh, one uh, two-player, and one game as a four-player game. Didn't play a three-player. And there's definitely differences. And I know that they put a whole system in there like, hey, admirals do this, generals do this. You use these leaders, you use these leaders, and so on and so forth. I still feel this is a two-player game. It plays best that way. Just my opinion on it. Especially since, and here's one of the big caveats of the game, okay? It's so long. It really is. I sound like a broken record whenever I review a big, heavy game, and I say things like that, and people criticize me like, what green group do you play in? And that might be valid criticism. Maybe my group is just a little bit slower than average. But this game is long. It really is. I mean, it could be over theoretically very quickly, depending on <laughs> how lucky the Imperials are in getting to the base and obliterating it, um, if they're that lucky. But then again, there's some workarounds for that, like mobilizing and getting out and so on. But uh, assuming everything goes as the natural flow, you're talking about a game that's going to last several hours. And um, even though the rounds go relatively quickly, at a certain point, you can feel like things start to get a little bit like samey. Not samey, but like, this is interesting. I really want to dig down to the bottom of the deck and get to the interesting cards. You know, the Imperials just want to, like, I want my Super Laser Online card. And the Rebels are like, I want my Steal the Death Star Plants cards. Or, you've destroyed three of my planets. Now, where is that card that moves the reputation track up equal to the number of destroyed systems? I need it. So, um, at a certain point, it's, that waiting game turns into just a, an expectation game. Like, come on, please. Which can be a little bit weird and kind of dull. Um, and really, that's but that's the major problem, I think. That's the only major problem, is the length of the game, the learning curve, and just the fact that the combat is a little bit like, eh, you know, they could have done a little bit more there, or less, and just kept that even really simple and cut that whole part out, just to get to the really intriguing stuff with the leaders in the missions, which I think is the heart of the game, um, uh, together with the asymmetrical nature of it. I could go on. Um, but I think this is a fantastic game. I really do. I'll probably come to like it even more, assuming I can get it played more. But of course, with the time issue, who knows? Um, but I love the asymmetrical nature of it. I love the leader system. I love the theme. They did such a great job with the theme, whether you're a Star Wars fan or not. Four players, fine. I think two player is where it's at. But any way you want to choose to play it, I think it's super cool and interesting. Um, another great game from Corey Kniska and Fantasy Flight Games definitely check it out believe the hype thanks for watching follow us on facebook twitter and patreon and make sure to check out our sponsor board game bliss where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world boardgamebliss.com thanks for your support